Hey there ladies and gents, welcome back to the vlog. My name is Drew and this is an eraser. And I'm slowly becoming cognizant of the fact that there are very few things on my desk that I can use to kick off these videos. So I'm gonna have to find more obscure things to kick things off. But that's an aside. Today we're going to be talking about this guy, Alfred Adler. First, a short disclaimer. Today's video is going to cover a topic within the realm of mental health. Because we are all beautiful beings with beautiful minds, the topic of mental health and mental illness is a very complex one and can vary from person to person. It's worth noting that all the information that I bring forth in this video is purely anecdotal and has not been evaluated by anybody for clinical significance. Also, this video in its entirety, in all shapes and forms, should not be considered as a replacement for a proper diagnosis and treatment by a trained mental health professional. If you are in an emotional crisis or you are feeling suicidal, please reach out to one of these resources on your screen now. I can't be sure of what's going on in your life or what you're thinking or how true or how false it might be, but I can promise you, your life is worth at least a phone call. So all of that rough stuff, all the disclaimer stuff out of the way, let's get into the fun stuff. Back to you, Drew. There he is looking pensive and deep in thought. <laughs> And yeah, I like this picture. So first and foremost, if you haven't heard the name Alfred Adler before, I am so sorry because he is one of the most incredible psychologists, at least in my opinion, and oftentimes we don't remember him as, as remarkably as we should, or not as frequently as he should. He did a lot of really cool stuff, and our kind of modern notion of therapy, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of CBT comes from Adler's theories and his techniques, and they've morphed over the years, but what I hope is that when we talk about his life and some of the things that he said and some of the theories that he pioneered, you can kind of say, okay, aha, uh -huh, that makes sense, or that is very similar to how we do mental health and mental illness recovery and therapy nowadays. So to kick things off, let's start off with who was Adler? Adler was an Austrian psychologist who lived from 1870 to 1937. The Austrians were very good at psychology. Freud was Austrian as well, and Adler was in there as in the area and the time at all of that was happening. And he pioneered a number of theories such as the theory of the superiority and inferiority complex. If you've ever heard inferiority complex, that's Adler. And he also pioneered the idea of individual psychology. Individual psychology is the practice of evaluating a client or a thinker as an individual whole by his words. So it gives rise to the notion of a more holistic approach to psychology that considers a lot of things just beyond brain chemistry and cognition. It looks at environment and a whole bunch of other different things, your overall health and the places that you live, the socioeconomic factors. Like I said, a very holistic view and a very holistic picture of your psyche and what makes you think and do the things that you think and do. Freud and Adler actually did get along for a little bit. They were cohorts, I believe, or I, I can't remember, I didn't have time to research it, my apologies, but every, for some reason I seem to remember that Adler was actually a student of Freud, or they worked very closely together, and Adler got along with Freud pretty well, but he didn't agree with him entirely, specifically in the realm of childhood trauma and how childhood affects our overall development. Freud basically said that, <laughs> oh, well, not going into the intricacies of the Oedipus complex because that's another video entirely, but Freud said that childhood trauma and childhood development is almost completely substantial to your development later in life. So a lot of who you are today is based on what happened to you as a child or something that, some sort of inner turmoil or something that happened to you as a child. Adler said, yeah, that kind of makes sense, but not so much, fam. Uh, childhood trauma and childhood development is a big part of it, but there are other forces that you need to consider. And so one, that was just one of a few different areas where they didn't quite see eye to eye, and eventually why Adler left Freud's no, sort of God, please, no. Freud's sort of research area and kind of did his own thing or went off and did his own thing. Let's talk a little bit about how I came to know Adler. So a couple of months back when I had my panic attacks and my sort of anxious break, I knew I needed help and I went to counseling at a local counseling center and I met Matt, who is my counselor currently. And Matt, if you're watching this, how's it going? But Matt is an Adlerian psychologist. And one thing I noticed when I was reading his bio is that he talked about the Adlerian approach, which was something that I'd never heard of before. I'd been in therapy before for Asperger's and autism early in my life, but nothing particularly Adlerian, I guess you can say, or no mention of this Adlerian 
thing. Well, as I started to do research, I noticed that Adlerian is the contemporary body of knowledge or the contemporary practice that was built on the fundamentals that Adler employed or Adler's kind of model for therapy. So if you ever hear the term Adlerian therapy or Adlerian psychology, that's Adler again. So he's got a whole area of therapy named after him, which is great. He deserves it. And when I started to read into Adler, his theories made a lot of sense to me. I know that Freud and some of the other guys were kind of thinking on this higher level and more metaphysical level and really getting very theoretical, but Adler was very down to earth. His theories kind of speak in a way that's very, not existential, but very everyday. Like it makes sense in everyday life. It's easy to kind of relate to. And so I think that's why I sort of gravitate towards him. And Adler's body of work actually has a lot of really cool and a lot of very popular psychological topics within it. So compensation and overcompensation. So the idea that we do the things that we do to compensate for something. And if you are hyper vigilant in compensation, you tend to overcompensate. We talked about the inferiority and superiority complex, the idea that we are faced with certain trials every day or certain trials within our lives and the inferiority complex makes us want to run away from it or do safeguarding measures. And the superiority complex kind of gives you the gusto to make it through it and inevitably when you come through it, you become a better version of yourself. So you are superior, hence why it's called the superiority complex. He also talked a lot about working through cognitive distortions and vague and upsetting thoughts. So in, there's a couple different steps to Adler's uh, traditional approach to therapy. And the first step is a lot of going through inventory, looking at recollections of you know what your childhood was like. And if you come upon a thought or something like that, that's kind of vague or this is the way that it is, or this upsets me, but I don't know why, then you use the Socratic method, which we'll be talking about in another video separately. You use the Socratic method to dive into what is the trauma behind that, and then, aha, we find something, and we can work through that and resolve your anxiety or your depression or your issues of esteem surrounding that idea. So that's working through cognitive distortion and vague thought using the Socratic method, which was something that Adler was fond of. Another thing that Adler brought to the attention of the psychology community was the idea of safeguarding tendencies. Safeguarding tendencies are, and this is going to hit very, very close to home for a lot of you guys I know, but a safeguarding tendency is essentially any act that or behavior that a person goes through to avoid some sort of trauma or some sort of anxiety or some sort of feeling. Sound familiar? Yes, that's the basic idea behind OCD. So if you suffer with OCD like I do, the second letter in OCD is compulsion. So a compulsion is a safeguarding tendency. It's just it happens to be overzealous and it's kind of responding to a threat or doing an action on response to a threat that doesn't exist or nearly isn't as bad as you think it is. So this is why I say Adler's theories really, really speak to me. It's because here he is in the early 1900s, the late 1800s, pioneering these ideas that basically laid the framework for later mental health issues like OCD, anxiety, that sort of thing. And he did it all without realizing how much impact it would be later down the road. And it just kind of makes sense, at least to me. And then finally, one of the big things that Adler is known for is the psychology of use. And that's a big one for me. The psychology of use basically states that the thinker or the client will make of their situation what they will, if that makes sense. So you cognizantly choose the meanings that you kind of give to events. So if you're going through trauma or you're going through recovery or something like that, and you say, inevitably something good will come of this, then it will, and your brain will habituate to that, and inevitably it'll make decisions to get you towards that outcome. But if you sit there with the trauma and you say, oh, I'm helpless, this will only happen again, I'm a horrible person, or I'm defeated, I'm incomplete, that's a very dark way to think, but inevitably your brain will fight you for it, because your brain, in some ways, doesn't want you to think that way, but in time it can habituate to it, and that's where you get ideas of like chronic depression, chronic anxiety, that sort of thing, because your brain has habituated to those thoughts, and you are using those thoughts as a means to say, hey, you know, I'm broken, that sort of thing. So make of it what you will, literally. That's the idea of the psychology of use. So we could sit here and debate theory all day and talk about Adler's CV and all the stuff that he added to the world of psychology, but I think this will really hit home for a lot of people, or this will kind of all make sense to you 
when you hear some of the things that Adler has been quoted as saying and kind of dive into what they mean to you and to me, I'll of course be giving my opinion, but at the very least take these quotes and kind of think about them and look at your mental health situation at the current moment and see if Adler's wisdom can somehow aid you or help you in a way. First and foremost, the only normal people are the ones you don't know very well. The way that I interpret that is everybody on this earth is beautiful. Everybody is an amazing human being. We're all humans with a great mind. We do beautiful, beautiful things in our minds. We create beautiful, beautiful things. But inevitably, from time to time in our lives, we go through events that change us, for better or for worse. For worse, obviously, is trauma. For better is like self-improvement and self-awareness, introspection, things like that. So due to the complexity of your life and the world in which we live, everybody has something that they're going through. And there's something below the surface and understanding that fact can really help you to empathize better and to connect with people better and inevitably live a better life. And we'll go into another one of Adler's quotes that speaks to this directly, but always be cognizant, be thoughtful of other people, realize that they're going through some rough stuff as well and have the empathy, have the compassion to say, okay, let me know what it is that's going on in your life and let me see if I can help you. If you live that way, life tends to get a lot, a lot better very, very quickly. My second favorite quote from Adler, or the second quote on this list, I should say, is meanings are not determined by situations, but we determine ourselves by the meanings we give situations. This is what I was kind of talking about earlier. So the psychology view says that you make of whatever situation what you will. So we all go through stuff in life, like we were talking about in the previous quote. We go through good stuff, we go through rough stuff, but what we make of these situations inevitably determines our attitudes and thusly our persona. You can get knocked down 10 times. As long as you get up the 11th time and say, hey, I'm gonna learn from this, I'm gonna learn to block, or this guy caught me with a right hook or something like that. Life caught me off guard somehow, but I know how to guard against that now. Then you're improving. As, as long as you keep getting up, as long as you keep going through stuff, as long as you keep saying that some good will come of this, all this suffering, all this pain, whatever I'm going through, the feeling, the crying at night, this is making me stronger. This is somehow gonna make me better then that's the way that you get through this. That's the way that you get through mental health recovery and how you survive and how you live a big, beautiful life away from this thing that you're going through. Always remember to make something good of the rough times and make the best of the best times so that when the rough times come around, you can remember the good times and work towards them. And before you know it, you'll be in a good place. Number three, the chief danger in life is that you may take too many precautions. This speaks to me specifically because of anxiety and OCD. OCD is rooted in the idea of compulsive behavior meant to avoid anxiety or basically keep you away from danger or hypervigilance towards danger. But living life in a bubble is no way to live life. And the easiest way to keep OCD and anxiety in check is to just go and live your life. Go and do incredible things. Go do something that OCD doesn't want you to do. Go do something that makes you scared, makes you nervous and learn that you can cope. If you sit inside all day and say, I can't cope, I can't go outside, I can't do this, I can't do that because I might mess up, your brain is gonna have no evidence to stand on with that. But if you go outside and you go do something, you go take a walk, you go talk to somebody, you make some sort of connection, you live your life, your brain's gonna start to say, huh, okay, she's making progress, he's doing well. Maybe there isn't much to this anxiety thing, or maybe this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Maybe he can cope, maybe she can make it through. That's what you're aiming for. That's how you put anxiety to bed, that's how you put OCD to bed. Just go live your life, and if everything comes crashing down, well, at least you lived a life where you were living till your last dying breath, and you weren't scared, and you didn't die alone or afraid. Next is, you may be cured of depression if every day you begin by contemplating how you will bring joy to somebody else. This is a very big thing for me, and I really like that Adler used cured of depression because that's really what it's all about. If it's the idea of empathy, compassion, and one thing we didn't talk about with Adler or earlier was he was really big on the idea of community and that we're all kind of interdependent on one another. And inevitably, when you do good and bring joy to the world, joy will come back your way. The longevity and the well-being of a one or yourself, the well-being of you and yourself is dependent on the well-being of others. So if you live in a good community or you associate with the right people, you don't let people bring you down, 
you eliminate the negative and toxic people in your life, the negative and toxic forces, and you replace them with good habits, good cognition, that sort of thing, that's how you bring yourself out of depression. That's how you bring yourself out of anxiety, is just being cognizant of why and how you think about yourself, about other people, and sometimes going out and just doing good for other people for the sake of doing good. If you can go out and do good for somebody and they thank you or they give you their praise or they have a high opinion of you, that does something to your psyche. Just understand, at a certain level, either subconscious or conscious, when you hear good things and you do good things, your brain triggers and your brain has this kind of aha moment where it's like, oh, I like making kids smile, or I like making people laugh, or I like doing good things, I like doing community service. Your brain wants those things to happen. Your brain, as you do more and more of it, will become more and more accustomed to it, and you'll live a healthier life and think more positively, I guess you can say. So I know it all seems dire, especially if you're dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression. It seems like all you do is think and ruminate all day about bad things, horrible things, and how you'll never be able to do anything or you're worthless, that sort of thing. But Adler is giving you a framework right here. He is saying, go out, do something good for somebody else. Don't think about yourself. Don't think about how horrible you are. Just go and do something good. Show your brain that you can do good. Show somebody else that you can do good. And eventually the rest will take care of itself. Finally, this is the last one on our list and it kind of wraps things up in a nice bow. Follow your heart, but take your brain with you. So at face value, this quote may make you think of loving yourself and being compassionate with yourself and doing what makes you happy. And it most certainly is. The quote, follow your heart, kind of has a notion, at least in the modern world, of going in the direction of doing what you love and the way to a fulfilled life is doing something that you enjoy and life is about the pursuit of doing good for others and following your passion. But in some ways, I feel like following your heart is a way of saying, go in the direction of happiness and fulfillment of not just yourself, but others. And this ties back to the previous quote, this ties back to kind of one of Adler's bigger themes, and that is that when we go out and we do good things, good things happen to us. The golden rule, equivalent exchange, whatever you want to call it. There is some truth to that notion. And I know it seems dire. Like I said, I, I said earlier, I know it seems hard. It's hard sometimes even just making it from day to day, from hour to hour, from minute to minute. But the more that you think about other people and bringing joy to their life, the more you take your mind off of anxious thoughts and how horrible a person you are and how all these things are going to go wrong. And when you really think about it, how horrible of a person could you be if you think about other people? If you're thinking about other people and you're being compassionate and you're wondering, hmm, how can I make somebody else's life today? Horrible people don't think that way. Horrible people only think of themselves and that sort of thing. So when you get out of your head and you think of other people, you follow your heart, you take yourself away from anxiety, you take yourself away from depression, you take yourself away from OCD, and you focus on somebody else and your brain kind of latches onto that. It starts to think and it starts to process and good stuff starts to happen. So that's where the second part comes in. Take your brain with you. So follow your heart. Your heart knows the way. Your, your brain is saying, do you know the way? And your heart is saying, yes, I know the way. And slipping in that meme right there. But take your brain with you. So follow your heart because you know in your heart to be compassionate and to go do good things is the way to live life. And if you do that, if you lead with your heart and you lead with going out and doing good things, your brain will follow and everything will work out. Simple as that. Very easy to talk about in theory, but putting it into practice is incredibly difficult. I know that for sure, having gone through anxiety and depression and OCD myself, but I promise you it gets better. I promise you this will pass. And the more and more you start to think about other people and bringing joy to their life, the easier and easier it gets. So that'll wrap things up today, friends. And as always, we're going to end in the traditional way. And that is by me saying, always remember that you are wanted, you are loved, and you are appreciated. You have a special talent that nobody else has, and the world is waiting on you to bring it out. So muster a little courage, go out into the world, and change it. That's what the world's waiting on. You.